Hi guys, so one of my reading resolutions for 2018 was to read more ancient literature and to learn more about mythology through reading both non-fiction and fiction books. And I've made a start on this through reading quite a few myth retellings, which I found has been quite a nice way into the world of mythology, which can be quite complex and confusing to someone who doesn't know where to start. Two of these are collections of stories which retell some of the most common myths in various mythologies and they were good places for me to start because they taught me about the myths themselves before I started reading more um, fictional books that were retellings of these myths and transposed them onto different contexts. One of these collections that I particularly enjoyed was Neil Gaiman's Norse Mythology, which, as the title suggests, was a collection of the Norse myths from the creation of the world to the apocalyptic Ragnarok. I listened to the audiobook version of this book, which was great because it was narrated by Neil Gaiman himself, although I think maybe reading it in paperback format would have been better to get an idea of how the names are all spelt, because that does get a little bit convoluted. I really enjoyed this collection because it took the contradictory and often quite illogical stories of Norse mythology and it made them more accessible. Um, and I really like the fact that it was written in a fictional format with a lot of dialogue rather than being overly informative, which I find that a lot of um, collections involving Norse mythology tend to be comprised of. So for me it was a fairly good place to start, um, having very little knowledge of any Norse myths, although Neil Gaiman said he did want to try and, and include some of the lesser known myths. Um, which I can really understand because, um, of course, he wants to gain as wide a reader readership as possible by combining the more popular and the more obscure myths. Norse mythology hasn't survived nearly as intact as Greek mythology, unfortunately, so there's just so much less source material to draw from. Uh, so almost all the stories in this collection kind of involve the main gods of Thor, Loki and Odin. Um, but this isn't really a criticism because uh, I think that Neil Gaiman really did the best with the resources he had. It was clearly a really well-researched book and it made me excited to learn more about Norse mythology because it is one of those collections of myths that is much lesser known um, and I, I really hope that more people will engage with them through books like this. The other collection that I've really enjoyed recently is Stephen Fry's Mythos, which details Greek mythology, again from the creation of the world through to the Titans and the Olympians, to the creation of humanity, and um, includes some of the most popular and some more lesser known stories from this canon. It was written with Stephen Fry's recognisable wit and his wry intelligence, and uh, one of my favourite aspects of this book is the inclusion of notes at the bottom of the pages, which either gave more detailed information if you want it, or um, some etymological information about the words that he uses, and these are often really insightful, often really humorous, uh, and I really would recommend you don't skim over them if you're reading this book. For me this really was an introduction into Greek mythology because I had really scant knowledge beforehand, um, and it was a great place to start because it introduced me to all the main players uh, in a way that was not overwhelming because, especially in Greek mythology, there are just so many different characters and it can be completely confusing. I think this book does a great job of keeping the reader in the loop even if they have very little information to begin with. Um, and it's a book that I would really like to revisit. It's one of those ones that you're not going to remember everything the first time round, but it, they're great stories to know and be able to tell to other people. So I think it's one of those books that's going to be great value for money. Moving on to re-envisionings of ancient texts, Margaret Atwood's The Penelope Ad is a really great example because it is it takes the story of Homer's Odyssey and tells it from the perspective of Odysseus's wife Penelope, who stays at home while Odysseus is travelling and returning home and she is trying to remain loyal to her husband and reject the increasingly insistent suitors around her. Margaret Atwood writes about the dynamics between genders in quite a few of her books, of course The Handmaid's Tale being the most notable of these, but um, she's interesting in that she often rejects the term feminist for both her and her novels, and I think this one is included in that. It's not feminist in the sense that it recasts Penelope as a heroine, she is still true to her character in Homer's original, and the thread that runs through it is her absolute unwavering devotion to her husband, and she is also quite an emotional woman. It does, however, display in more subtle ways the strength that Penelope needed to remain faithful to her husband and to 
keep the, the hope alive that he would ever return to her. And uh, I think it's just great to hear from her perspective because, unsurprisingly, she is pretty eclipsed by Odysseus in the Odyssey. Uh, so it's, it's really insightful to hear from her perspective and in a modern context. Next I want to talk about The Vegetarian by Han Kang, which is a retelling of one of the stories in Ovid's Metamorphoses. And it was translated from the Korean by Deborah Smith and it won the Man Booker International Prize in 2016. It tells the story of a wife who decides to become a vegetarian to the extreme embarrassment of her family who believe she's contravening the expected etiquette and social norms of women in this society. It's a short and very strange novella and the blunt and um, uncompromising nature of the prose I think adds to this very raw feeling um, that we get throughout. It is um, extremely forthright in depicting issues like sexual violence and societal prejudice against women. One of the most intriguing things about this book is that it's narrated from the perspective of three different characters, none of which is the woman at the centre of the story. And I think this works really well actually in just highlighting the lack of autonomy she has within the text. And this book is maybe not as direct a uh, retelling as some of the other ones that I've read, and I think it's more implicit in the sense that if you don't have a knowledge of the story of Apollo and Daphne where Daphne transforms into a tree to reject the sexual advances of Apollo, then you might not pick up on some of the nuances of this text, but it definitely is a subtext within this book. Uh, and you can gain a lot more from it if you do have an understanding of of his metamorphoses. And it was really fascinating to see how this ancient text is um, transposed into the modern day. Next I'm going to talk about Girl Meets Boy, which alongside the Penelope ad is part of the Canongate myth series, where the publisher Canongate is commissioning authors to write retellings of myths from various mythologies around the globe. This one by the amazing Ali Smith is also a retelling of a story from Ovid's Metamorphoses, the story of Iphis and Ianthe, uh, in which Iphis is a female who's brought up as a boy but falls in love with the female Ianthe and um, is then transformed into a male so that they can marry. In this retelling, Anthea works in a bottled water company and this book is a really sharp criticism of um, how the capitalist system uses natural resources like water um, for their own ends. But it's also a love story between Anthea and Robin, who is an androgynous uh, act, um, eco-activist. Robin rejects traditional gender stereotypes and in this way this book really focuses on um, prejudices against homosexuality and of ambiguous gender and um, it's a really incisive look into how we see gender in the 21st century um, by looking at it through a classical lens. And I think Ali Smith is an absolutely glorious writer and I would say that if you've not read any of her books this is quite a good place to start because it is fairly short and she has a fairly unusual writing style so you can see quite easily whether or not it's for you. I've been meaning to read The Song of Achilles for a while now and when I heard that Madeline Miller was coming out with a new book this month, Circe, I really needed to make it a priority. So I'm so glad that I did. Uh, I really adored this book. It's a retelling of the story of Achilles from Homer's The Iliad, but it is uh, written from the perspective of uh, Achilles' friend and lover, Patroclus. Patroclus is rejected by his father at a young age for his weak tendencies and he forms an unlikely friendship with the athletic Achilles which blossoms into a more intimate relationship as they grow older. And I'm a bit of a miser when it comes to love stories in books. I tend not to enjoy them very much but this one was done absolutely beautifully. You absolutely get the sense of Patroclus's devotion for Achilles and his continual worry for him while he's fighting in the Trojan War. About half of this book is dedicated to the Trojan War and this was something that I was a little bit worried about because I'm not particularly interested in reading about battle strategies and fighting but the book really never loses its focus as being about the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus. It's just gloriously written, it is clearly very well researched by a classicist but it wears this research lightly, it never feels overstuffed with historical detail. 
And for me as someone who didn't know a great deal about Achilles, this was a really lovely way to get an introduction into his story. One last book I'd like to mention quite quickly is Donna Tartt's The Secret History, which is not directly a myth retelling, but it does draw a great deal from Euripides' play The Bacchae in its um, inclusion of themes surrounding hedonism versus rationality. And the main characters in this book all study ancient Greek, so there is classical references that litter the, the book. It's about a group of college friends who decide to murder one of this group, and the plot is really revolving around their reasoning behind doing this um, in a slightly crime and punishment-esque way. But it's done absolutely beautifully. It's one of the best books I've read in quite a number of years and I have made a separate video all about it. So I'm not going to mention it anymore here, but I will link that above and also in the description if you'd like to hear more about that. But anyway, those are my recommendations for today. I'm sure as the year progresses I'll be reading a fair few more, so I would really like to hear your suggestions as well and I would imagine there might be a part two at some point, so let's wait and see. But I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you soon. Bye bye!